Hello everyone. I want to go over one of my favorite topics in AI, which is hidden Markov models, or HMMs for short. The way that I motivated this in class was by looking at a little game where we were on a grid and we could choose these orange grid points. And we had to stay as close as possible to this green dot that was moving around without jumping too much, without jumping too far from, from the orange dot that we're at. So we'll start off right here next to the green dot. And we'll, we'll follow the green dot along. I guess now I'll jump up here. And now I'll jump up here. And now the green dot jumps over here, kind of far from where we were. So there's two costs that we're racking up here. One is called the observation cost, and that's how far we are from the green dot. The other one is the transition cost, and that's, that's how much we have to jump to get from where we just were to where we're going next. So here I have a decision to make and there's gonna be a trade-off. I can either sort of stay exactly where I am and have no transition cost, or I can jump to where the observation is and have a large transition cost, but a small observation cost. So let me do the first one first, where I stay where I am. And notice that the transition cost didn't change at all, but the observation cost was quite large. By contrast, let me start over again. Um, if I start off here and I actually jump closer to where the observation is, I incur a large transition cost, but a smaller observation cost. But there's a trade-off here. And, and what people realized in class was that it's best to kind of compromise between the two. So don't be so greedy with the observation and jump straight to what we think the observation is. But don't stay where we are. Let's, let's try to move a little bit towards the observation. So try to go somewhere in the middle. And so I'll move maybe sort of halfway to the observation, find a state that's maybe around halfway there. And that was the strategy. And so here, you know, it's not moving too much, so. But now it moves a lot, but it might as well stay where I am because it kind of moved the other way, right? So that, that we found was an optimal strategy. And so in some sense, what we're doing is trading off how much we pay attention to the observation versus how much we move. So I don't want to move too much, but I also want to respect the observation. Okay, so to make this more formal, let me show a graphical model of what a hidden Markov model is, and, and I will point out how it maps onto this game here. So in the notes that I had on this topic, I drew up this picture here. And so for the hidden Markov model, what we have are a bunch of hidden states. We don't actually know what they are, but we assume that they follow a Markov process. So where you go next only depends on where you just were. What we do have is an observation of the state. So not exactly the hidden state that we're looking for, but something that's related to it. And from that sequence of observations, we can do a couple things to infer what, what the hidden states might have been. The analogy back here is that the hidden state is where we're supposed to be on the grid. And the observation is this green trajectory here. And so the blue trajectory is our sequence of hidden states that we're trying to infer over time. But there's much more exciting applications of this. Um, basically any sequence that you could think of where the data that you have is not exactly what you want to know. So for example, if I'm doing speech to text, the thing that I might observe is the speech. This would come in the form of noisy audio samples. And the thing that I want to infer, the hidden state, is going to be the actual phonemes of that audio, which I can assemble into a string. Um, I could even consider the hidden state to be my language and the observation to be a language that's foreign to me. So for example, if I was translating, trying to tr automatically translate German into English. Um, in fact, on the syllabus, I, I have a link to a paper that does this. So if we go down to 
um, a statistical approach to machine translation. There's a paper from the 90s that, that does this with hidden Markov models. And so, so they talk, see, look, there's our familiar little Bayes equation there, right? And yeah, there's a lot of other applications. Um, those who are in music would have done beat tracking with me, where um, the observation is something called an audio novelty function, which, which indicates possible percussive events. And then it's our job to pick out which events are actually beats and which ones are not. And so, so here is, is it's working pretty well. Um, I should realize I can't play the audio because it's it's <laughs> um, it's going to flag this video. But this is a Barry White song, and um, this does a very good job of keeping the beat. You can go check out this page on your own. Um, and it knows that even though sometimes there's peaks in this in this observation function, this called the auto novelty function, it knows that it shouldn't consider those to be beats. So it's kind of, again, it's balancing the observation of this blue curve, the auto novelty function, against the hidden state transitions. The fact that I'm supposed to keep tempo. So I know about what the spacing should be in between the moments that I say are actually beats. So lots of cool applications here. And one that I want to hone in on, actually, because I think it's fairly concrete, and I'll use it as an example over the next couple of videos, is robot localization. Okay, let me explain the robot localization problem now. The version that we'll use in this example is a simplified version where you have a map ahead of time, fully mapped out. Each pixel that's drawn in white here is a potential location that I could be on the map. This is the information I wanna know. I want to be able to track the robot over time and know where it is, that's what localization means. But that's not actually what I have in practice. In practice, I have something that I'm sensing about my environment where I am. And in particular, I'm gonna use a simulation of a laser range scanner. So this is an example of a Hoku U um, laser range scanner. It costs a few thousand dollars, so I'm not actually gonna do this for real, I'm going to simulate it. But the way it works is it sends a laser out in, in a 270 degree field of view and it sees what does that laser bounce off of and how far away is that thing. So it's telling you what is closest to you in a bunch of different directions. And so where, based on where I am, I can kind of see, okay, here I'm in this long skinny hallway. I can kind of see part of the hallway. When I pass by that little intersection, I, I actually could see into there a little bit. But this is not you know, all the information about where I am in the map. This is just, an observation that I have from a sensor that I'm able to put on my robot. And from that, I wanna be able to infer where is the robot actually, okay? So let me say a little bit more about this sensor model here. Um, if I go to some of the code here, what I've done is uh, set up a little simulation that, that simulates this laser range scanner on a map. And what, what I'll do is collect um, what would a perfect laser range scan look at every location on the map? So if I could give you a perfect observation with no noise, what would it look like right here, right here, right here? Actually, that's exactly what I'm showing here. In practice, what we will get is a noisier version. These sensors are not gonna be perfect. So see how it's a little bit corrupted here. Actually, I'll show you, it's very exciting with these tools. They're, they're so good that um, you'll be able to get good results even with very, very noisy sensors. But actually, let me go back. I'm gonna turn down the noise a little bit. This was four before, now it's 0.5. That, that number is how much noise there is. We'll start with this just to make it a little more concrete and easy to see. Now, the first thing I do is I collect the idealized scans at every location in the map. So every possible state. So what I'm doing here is I'm going to every location and recording what a perfect scan, like basically all this information would look like at every single pixel. I collect that in an array called state scans. This has as many elements as there are pixels, as there are states in the map. Now I'm gonna create another array called observe scans, where I'm going to simulate a noisy version of the sensor that goes through this trajectory that I have and gives me back a noisy state scan that I would get at every moment in time. 
So in this observed scans array, there is a scan for every moment in time along the trajectory. So let me show you what the trajectory looks like real quick. So if I look at the trajectory, there's a method called env.plot. So this is an object, I can plot the map. Right on top of that, I can plot what the trajectory is that I'm simulating. So I actually know exactly what it is because I'm simulating it, although now I'm going to just give you some noisy data and we'll see if we can estimate it just from the simulated observations. Although I have the perfect um, answer here to start with, okay? So what I wanna look at is, okay, let's suppose I had a couple examples here that, that were interesting. So what if I picked out um, the observation that I get at time index 55? So actually first let me plot, where am I at time index 55? So I would be at this X location, this Y location. So the arrays are such that the first column is the X coordinate and the second column is the Y coordinate. So here I am on the map. And what scan do I get then? Well, I'll go ahead and plot uh, the observed scans at that index. And this is just a different way of plotting the same data I was showing a moment ago. Um, this, this is just indexed by angle here but it's the same data that's, that's plotted in polar coordinates here. So, so that's the noisy scan that I get. Now what about, okay, so how does this scan compare to my ideal scans at different locations on the map? So I can look at a different state here. So what if I were to look at um, the 172nd pixel um, in the map? So that would be the pixel at this location. Pretty far from where, where I took my observation, so I wouldn't expect the laser range scans to be too similar, but let's have a look. So if I were to plot the um, state scan at index 172, here's what I would get, the orange curve here. And let me do that, plot that dotted, just to emphasize the dotted line is the ideal measurement that I would get if I were at a particular location. Okay, let's pick a location, let's pick, let's pick a state in the map, a location in the map that's closer to where our observation was actually made. So if I look instead at um, location index 459, then that is pretty darn close to where I am. So let's look at that laser range scan, 459. And so you see that the green lines up much better with the blue than the orange does. So what I'm, gonna, what I'm gonna do is create a measurement model. So just like back in this example where we started, I had a way of saying how similar this observation was to a particular location. It was just the distance. I'm like, the closer I am, you know, measuring the distance here, the more similar my observation is to my state. Um, here, I'm just going to compare every single radial measurement and, and sum up the square differences between them. And, and that will give me a, a similarity measure between my observations here and, and the states here. So actually, I, I created a helper method to compute the probabilities in that way. So to show you what I mean, let me call that method. So there's a method I have called get measurement prob, and it's given a particular state location. What is the probability that you made a particular observation? So given that I'm at state, we'll say 172. So I'll actually I'll say state scans. So given that I have this idealized scan at state 172, what is the probability that I made this particular observation at time 55 and part of the the measurement model is the probability of noise which is alpha or the variance of the noise and actually these probabilities are pretty tiny because i have to i end up treating each angle as independent and, and i multiply them together so i'm actually going to i'm going to show the log of this um, and let me just show it out to maybe three decimal places so I'll first see if that worked, and then I'll show you the other one. Okay, good. So I'm seeing, okay, the, the log probability is negative one 
31 roughly. Um, so the, the, the log probability of observing um, this blue scan, given that I'm at the orange location, is, is negative 130. Um, the probability of observing the blue scan given I'm at the green location, which is 459, is, I forgot a comma, that is a lot higher. Okay, so negative 79. So, so it's much more likely that I'm at the, the green location than it is that I'm at the orange location. And that's how I can see it through the observation model. But of course, that's only one part of the equation, right? That's just the observation part. That's, that's just like this green trajectory here bouncing around. Um, we also need to know about how we transition to. To show you, I mean, if, if I'm at this location, here's a heat map that shows all the probabilities at all um, possible states on the map. And there's some ambiguity. You know, if, if I make this observation, I could be in this hallway, but I could also be in this hallway, maybe even this one or this one. And so knowing that I was just at a point in the hallway over here helps me to narrow down to, to the hallway up, up here. So, so, the, so again, the, the, the observations like this and the transitions, knowing where we just were, um, work together to give us a really good estimate. And what I'd like to do next is, is start to explain the details of how that works. Okay, but this was just an introduction to hidden Markov models and, and the example that we're going to be using.